Stand to your feet tonight. Welcome. This is a week of revival here at Life in Christ Church. And we're so glad that you're here with us. We're so thankful for what God is doing, what he's already done in these days, and what's still to come. Hallelujah. We're moving up to higher levels. How many of you are expecting for things to change this week? Expecting a touch from God. Expecting an encounter. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your presence is here. We thank you, Father, for, for signs and wonders and miracles in this place. We thank you, Lord, that revival is here among us. And we are excited, Father. We are hungry. We are, we are anticipating and expecting great things tonight in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you ready to rejoice tonight?
deserve the glory and the honor. We lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory.
Right. How many know anything is possible with God? I said, how many know anything is possible with God? <laughs> that ever overcome your life, and there is no rival. Ever stand against your mind, you've always been with the Every battle you've already won. Already won. There is no weapon that has ever left its mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. Oh, you've always been
possible. Oh, how many believe it's possible tonight? Let's sing this out. All of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush this opponent and break it. Oh, all of my fear I will turn into shame. Shake off despair as I sing. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. Oh, all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair.
control. Set fast, unmovable. Nothing's impossible. I got it. Let's sing it again together. Come on. He reigns in your life. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and sing hallelujah. Go ahead, sing it out. Oh, 
Christ is my foot. Shout it out like you know it. The rock. The rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaking. Oh, I never. And I put my faith. Said he never let me down. He's faithful. Let's raise our hands right here because we know that our God is faithful. He's faithful to perform his word, his word concerning us, and his promise is yes and amen. And we are in expectation of him to move. Thank you for your hand that's upon the United States of America. Thank you for your hand that's upon the people who are here today. Father, all years you've been bringing in pastors and ministers that would like a fresh touch from God as they feel a stirring in their spirit of your plan to double the church and to be a part of this last great move of God. I pray tonight would be a major part of that in Jesus' name. Let tonight be a great, of imparta great night of impartation by the Holy Ghost. And for all these things, we're thankful and careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. For it's to you and you alone who it's due. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said amen. 
Give the Lord one more great hand clap. You can be seated. Brother Devin, I'm very thin up here as compared to the rest of the week. So I'm very thin up front in the monitors. Um, we had a we had a welcome to Tuesday night. I don't know if I have, I can welcome somebody to their own town when I'm a visitor, but we'll try it. Welcome. How many came expecting to receive from the Lord tonight? I met a young man this afternoon, and he said, when you came to our church, um, well, he was in meetings. I said, what, how old would you have been when I came to Dillsburg? And we figured out he was nine years old. He was born with a heart problem, and he said, when I walked by him while I was preaching, he felt a warm feeling in his heart and could tell he was healed. His heart would get off rhythm, and uh, he'll tell on the testimony what else happened, but when I was thinking about what happened to that kid, we actually have a family that comes to our church in Fort Worth, Texas from the meeting in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. And um, they had somebody they knew, and of course I still know that family, um, their son was born with a major, what did he have? Tourette's, not a stutter, I was going to say a stutter, he had Tourette's, and he had Tourette's so bad that they made him stay home from public school, they paid the family to homeschool him because they said, we can't have class with him in class. The kids would make fun of him when he'd tick, plus the ticks themselves would throw the teacher off. You know you have bad Tourette's when they say you disrupt public school too bad because you have to disrupt public school pretty bad for anyone to notice. And uh, he got, what happened was, he got baptized in the Holy Ghost one of the nights we were laying hands on everybody. And when he finished speaking in tongues that night, he never ticked anymore. So the, the way they noticed was, his, everybody say a miracle. a miracle. My Uncle Ted says something, if you've ever heard him preach, he says when, a, when, a, when you have a miracle, it's like a rock hitting a pond, the ripples go out. So when the miracle hits, there, there's residual effects. Just like if somebody dies early, you know, somebody might get depressed about it and have to go on medication. When the devil attacks, there's ripple effects. But then when, God, when God's power is loosed, it does wonderful things even beyond the miracle. So the next day, that young man would help his father at um, an excavation company. And they had a big guy, big Irish guy. His last name was Kelly. I'm trying to think of his first name. But he, he didn't go to church. He, wasn't, he, wasn't a, he was a good guy and everything. He just didn't like church. So when he was working with the young guy, he noticed after a few minutes, he said, what ha you haven't had one tick the whole time we've been talking. What happened? He said, well, they had this evangelist come in. For those of you who don't know, there's a church called Celebration Community Church with Pastor Mike Hammer. They had a Dallas and I in for three days in 2011. Pastor Rodney Howard Brown had just given me a word that everything was going to go in our ministry to the next level. And uh, Tuesday night, we had about double what was there Sunday night. This is March 2011. And uh, Dave Colonin from The Couriers is Mike Hammer's uh, father-in-law. So the Lord set it up because... I don't think too many pastors anymore know anything about extended meetings. You know, my dad told me when he started out in evangelism, you used to have to, you would go two weeks no matter what. If the meetings went bad, the pastor would say, well, we didn't get the breakthrough this week, let's go another week. And then if it went good, they'd say, let's go another week. But now they don't even have really revival meetings. They just have maybe a conference every year with three different speakers. But conferences aren't revival meetings. They're, they're totally different. When you have three speakers in that all do their night, it doesn't build on each other. In fact, a lot of times it goes in the opposite direction. One guy preaches on miracles. One guy preaches against miracles. One guy tells you God wants to heal you of your pain. The next night they tell you there's a purpose in your pain. So it doesn't go anywhere. But when you have, when you have revival, the Bible says that Philip went to Samaria and preached Christ to them. Turn there with me. Acts chapter 8. Acts the 8th chapter. I've been preaching out of this chapter for the better part of a month. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Acts the 8th chapter and the 4th verse. But the believers who were scattered preached the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message Everybody say, hear his message. Hear his message. <laughs> and see the miracles that he did. So there is this, all through the Bible, there's this thread. And Paul taught it as doctrine. 
in the book of Acts, you see that they not only spoke a message, there was accompanying power that came behind the message. We just finished a holiday that's called Easter Resurrection Sunday, or if you're a Democrat, Trans Day of Visibility. And so that, that day celebrates that Jesus rose from the dead. And then the Bible says that God watches over his word to perform it or to confirm it. So different than any other religion, when you preach the word of God, the God that authored the book is alive. And he watches over it to make it good. So Paul said three different places specifically. Romans chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Basically words to the effect of, brethren, when I brought you the gospel, it was not in word only, but in power. I did this that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yes. Say that with me. That your faith, that your faith would, not rest would not rest in the wisdom of men, the of the men. But, in the of men. but in the power of God. They came to hear his message and see the miracles that he did. Actually, let me show you the three places in the Bible rather than just gloss over it. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans the 15th chapter. You guys have been great to preach to all week. If you're a visitor tonight, glad to have you. Thanks for welcoming me into your, your great town here. I love central Pennsylvania. I live out in Pittsburgh, but this, everybody knows whether they want to admit it or not, this is the best part of the state. <laughs> Romans chapter 15. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Romans 15. Paul said in verse 16. Since the beginning of this year, I've noticed something different happening in the meetings. There used to be a thing that happened when my dad started off in evangelism. My dad's still in evangelism. And when uh, he started out, if you went to go preach in Plattsburgh, New York, then all of the Assemblies of God pastors and a lot of the pastors in that area that were full gospel charismatic, they'd all come out to the meeting. There was a day, believe it or not, where preachers enjoyed being in church. And if they weren't preaching, they would go hear other people preach. But uh, then it started to turn into this every man for himself, every pastor hates the other pastor that's in the area. Why does he need to be here? I think he just wants to build a name. There was like this tension between pastors. But I noticed at the start of this year, the pendulum always swings back the other way. And you can see that, that what happened in the 80s is starting to happen again, where pastors, I can feel every night when I go to preach, I, that there's pastors that are coming, and they're not coming. Sometimes you'd have pastors come, and they weren't there to receive. They were there to just give a report as to, you know, that nonsense that's going on there. But I, I can tell a difference now that people are coming to receive. I was in Vancouver, British Columbia three weeks ago preaching, and I went down into the lobby of the hotel, and when I walked by, there was a guy in a chair. I'd never been to Western Canada in my life. I'd never been, been past Saskatoon. And this guy said, Pastor Jonathan. I said, you know me? He said, yeah. He said, well, I watch you on television. My wife and I flew in from Edmonton uh, to come hear you preach, and then we brought you an offering, and he gave me the offering. I took that as a sign. Then that week, there'd be people there from Calgary, Edmonton, out in the woods in British Columbia, uh, four hours away, Abbotsford, British Columbia. All these pastors would come in for the meeting. When I went to Los Angeles, I booked the um, Sheraton Gateway LAX right by the airport, right across the street from the LAX airport. I felt quickened to do it on the fast. So I just announced about nine days ahead of time, I'm going to go to the Sheraton Gateway LAX, just booked it, brought my own band, and we'll see who comes. If nobody comes, nobody comes. The place, we had about 4, 407 the last night. I was only there two nights. First night we had 3-something, then 407, 2, 260 in the morning on Saturday morning. And then when I said how many pastors are here, that if we came back, you would like to be a part of this. Uh, 18 pastors raised their hand, and 14 signed up to be a part of it. I don't even think you would have had that last year, because it's almost like ministers would resent Anything that happened that was outside of their thing. I don't want any evangelists coming here. You know, we have it going. But you can see it coming the other way now that people, maybe, maybe COVID and people's bad response to COVID, they realize they messed up. And when you get weak, it takes your pride away. Now, if you'll just stay humble, nothing will ever have to happen to humble you. But then you'll notice when people, when people are strong, they're different. And then when something happens, then, you know, something bad will happen. Nothing bad has to happen. 
But because of pride, the Bible says haughtiness comes before the, uh, uh, the fall and pride comes before destruction. When you let pride come in and nobody can talk to you and you know everything and you resent everybody else, then, then uh, uh, it opens a door for bad things. So if you will just stay in your Christian walk, humble and teachable, and ne never being a, a big shot, when the Lord blesses you, acting the exact same way as when you were at level one, then nothing will ever open its door into your life to humble you. So I see now that churches used to have pride and they were strong. There was an article in Pittsburgh, in the local Pittsburgh paper, it was right on the headline, it named the denomination of church, and it said that they're all emptying out. What will the response be? Is this the death? And it was written, you know, with their permission. They were saying, we don't know what we're doing. We're losing people. I think what the devil means for bad, God is going to take and turn for good. Because now people are reaching out and saying, you know what? We don't have everything figured out. We need to open ourselves to the move of God. I'm going to tell all the churches that are represented here in central Pennsylvania. One of the reasons, among others, that God brought me here is this is going to springboard a move of God in central Pennsylvania. Amen. Churches in this area are going to begin to double. If every church in this area doubled, it wouldn't even come close to scratching the surface of the amount of people that are here. There's enough people to go around for everybody. Instead of us all fighting over a few families that are already saved, a move of God's going to hit the churches beginning this week where you're going to go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in. Can you say amen? amen? So I want you to receive that tonight. When I say double, I don't mean some kind of weird prophetic double. I'm talking two times, you know, whatever amount of people you have in your church right now, multiplied by two. God will do that by the Spirit. There's boundaries in the Spirit that are broken in the Spirit. So if you are at a boundary that you haven't broken, 200 people, 150 people, until that's broken, you're always making an effort to try to get more people. But then if you will break that in the spirit, uh, something weird starts happening. I was preaching in Pittsburgh at my home church, and my goal was to hit 1,000 people uh, sometime. Well, we were only in month nine. We started off, they had given me the count, 717 people. We had praise and worship for 35 minutes, then announcement. So by the time I was preaching, we were about 51 minutes into the service. And I'm preaching, and packs of 25 and 40 people are still coming through the door from everywhere. And I kept watching them, so they kept flashing me on the screen in the back. 840, exclamation point. That was a record. 913, exclamation point. 981, exclamation point. Then they put 994. I thought, if, it's, if it stays at 994, I'm going to get chloroform and duct tape and get six more people and hit 1,000. I'm not having 994. And then people kept coming. And it hit 1,087 people on that Sunday. I laid down. I was so floored, I, la I laid down on the floor. Because the thing that I thought was going to take years, if it ever happened, the Lord did that Sunday. I'm telling every person that's here that the things that you think are going to happen way off, or the devil convinced you are never going to happen, you're going to see them happen this year in Jesus' mighty name. This is the year of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's nothing the devil can do about it. Come on, if you receive that today, let's celebrate ahead of time. Clap your hands. Hey, I feel it. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Romans 15, 16. I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. What a thing to write. If, you, if Paul was in the assemblies of God and he wrote that, would they let him keep his credentials? I don't know. I'm asking you. I, Paul, am a special, if you wrote that, who's a pastor here besides, what's your, uh, Pastor, Land, pastor Landon R Ritchie, right? If you wrote to, to the district, I, Pastor Landon Ritchie, a special messenger of Jesus Christ, they would at least call you in for a meeting. Excuse me. So there's a devaluing, and I'm not picking on the assemblies of God. It would happen in the church of God too. It happened in any denomination. Who do you think you are? There are special messengers of Jesus Christ in the body. So they, they, what they have done, it's funny that Christians won't vote. They don't like communism, especially if you go into central Pennsylvania. You talk to any 
to any red-blooded American that's in church on Sunday, and you talk to a man and say, do you like communism? No, I don't. My dad fought in a war to, to stop that. But they all, when it comes to their church policies, are very communistic, socialistic. Everybody's the same. How many know the ground's level at the cross? Every, yeah, the ground's level at the cross in the sense that everybody has to get the, saved the same way. But after you leave the cross and start going forward, the ground gets pretty unlevel pretty quickly. For example, there's a man named Bishop Dag Haywood Mills. He has 6,000 churches under him. In fact, there's, he has a church at the University of Pittsburgh, and he's based in Ghana. When I preached in Las Vegas, his church from Las Vegas and Reno came to the meeting. When I preached in L.A., his church from L.A. came to the meeting. He has 6,000 churches. I have two. His main, <coughs> his main church has 8,000 people, and then he's got side churches in the same city, 6,000, 4,000, 3,000. That's in one city, and he's got those in Europe everywhere. I would be pretty stupid to not recognize that him and I aren't on the same level. Yes, we're both saved. Yes, potentially I have access to what he has attained to. But there are people in Christianity that are further down the road than me. And if I don't recognize that, then I can't ever receive from anybody. That's why most people, if you think everybody's the same, and you know, uh, we're all the same, brother. I got the same Holy Spirit you do. Yeah, you have the same Holy Spirit, but you're not operating. I don't mean me. I'm not operating in the same level of grace that, that Bishop Dagg is. So then knowing that, what do you do? I told you if you were here in the morning, they announced that they were going to have a supernatural church growth conference in, in Maryland. And I went because the pastor is Bishop David Oyedepo. He built a 50,000-seat church. They have five services on Sunday. All five services are packed, and they have a tent outside, three different tents that can fit together 200,000 more people. They have 510,000 individual worshipers that come every Sunday. 510,000. They don't count them in the seats. They count them when they come through the gate. So if you come and you stay for four services, you're not counted four times, you're counted one time. A half a million people that come to that place. Their church property is 12,000 acres. They have a Bible college. They have an agricultural school to teach people to grow their own food in Africa rather than come to America and beg for food. They have a plan to do what the government has failed to do. When he came to Washington, I canceled my meeting so that I could be there to hear him. And I came with an expectation to receive from, from his gift. I said, Father, what's in that man that caused him to overthrow the, the spiritual darkness that's in Nigeria? Please let me, let me receive that through his preaching. How do you receive impartation? There, there's a few ways. Number one, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, and his spirit entered into me when he spake unto me. Some of you have told me that you leave me on, on YouTube. When you would have trouble sleeping or were battling depression. For show of hands, how many of you during COVID, whether it was check the news or my preaching, or still, you keep me on a, in the house a decent amount because you, f you feel better or it charges your spirit? Yeah. That's because one of the ways that impartation comes is not just through the laying on of hands. The Bible says, and his spirit entered into me when he spake unto me. There is a power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it alone is the power of God at work. It, the gospel preached, is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. There's an evangelist from Pennsylvania that's now in heaven. His name was R.W. Shambach. He used to preach people out of wheelchairs. He'd get honed in on somebody in a wheelchair in the front row and start saying, it's getting in your bones, brother. It's getting in, in your feet, brother. And he'd start preaching the verses out of the Bible into their chest. And soon that guy would unstrap his legs from the chair and get up and run around the building. Because there's power in the preach word of God. <laughs> Listening to someone preach, you receive things that are in their spirit into your spirit. Everybody say impartation. Impartation is the grace that's in one vessel flowing freely into another vessel. That's why you see some preachers, and they preach like other preachers. In fact, if you're a student enough, I'll listen to someone preach, and I'll say, I bet he went to Ramah, or at least had some connection to Kenneth Hagin. 
Or I bet you that evangelist sat under R.W. Shambuck or sat under an evangelist who sat under R.W. Shambuck. I'll listen to a preacher and say, that guy's Southern Baptist. I can tell by how he was trained to preach. I can tell by his style. I can tell by how, how he's going at the altar call. You receive things from people. Some of the people that are here that are older. You know, if you've seen somebody's kid grow up, it's one thing when they're three, but the older they get, you'll say, that, that guy, that's uh, Mike's son. He's 41 now. He acts just like his father, Mike. I have people tell me, I think it's your dad preaching sometimes when I put it on. You're starting to sound more like your dad. You're starting to act more like your dad. Part of that's genetic, and part of it's sitting in his meetings, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, travel Saturday and do it again. His spirit Kate, was imparted to me by his preaching. So who you're around in the spirit determines what you get. If you hang around alcoholics, you'll get a drinking problem. If you hang around angry people, you'll have an anger problem. If you hang around people that run around on their wife or sleep around on their husband, soon you'll be battling that yourself because there's something in the spirit called impartation. But just like there's bad impartation, thank God there's good impartation. And you can get around like you are tonight. I said like you are tonight. You can make a decision. I'm going to get where the spirit of God is and I'm going to receive the good thing that God has for me. If that's why you're here tonight, make a signal to heaven. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So I went to that meeting with Bishop David Oyedepo to receive. Everybody say, come to receive. Come to receive. I, I'm not going to spend any time on that because I haven't felt hardly anybody come here not to receive. It's like the people, are such, and, and I felt that all year. I felt it in Vancouver. I felt it in, in um, Las Vegas at the casino that, that we rented to preach. First ministry that they allowed to rent a casino to preach since 1978. We, pre we preached in the Plaza uh, uh, Hotel and Casino in their ballroom. First time they've led a minister on any casino hotel in Las Vegas since 1978. Everybody say, the tide's turning. The tide's turning. I felt the people come there with hunger. I feel people, I don't feel any opposition. I don't feel anybody with their arms crossed in the spirit, staring me down, checking me out. I feel like people have come knowing they need a fresh drink of living, of living water. They need to eat the bread of life again. Yeah, thank God for everything he did in your past, but you can't run on past moves of God. But thank God there's fresh oil and fresh manna every day available for the people of God. Can you say Amen. When you come to a meeting to receive, it's different. You get things. I was sitting three quarters of the way in the back. There's about a thousand people there, and I was there, you know, in the back. I was there to receive. I wasn't looking to get a good seat or anything. I want to receive. And so a guy comes up and taps me on the shoulder. He said, Bishop Oyedepo would like you to sit on the platform with him. Well, that's an honor. I had met him one time at his church in Nigeria. I didn't think he'd recognize me. Or remember me, he meets a ton of people, half a million people every Sunday, let alone the rest of the week. So I was honored, and I went up and sat there. And then I, I remember, I could tell you what he preached. He preached for two and a half hours on, on a, a move of God that's coming to America and what pastors need to be ready for. Because soon America, he said, the Lord has spoken to me that soon America will not be full of mega churches. It'll be full of super mega churches. That the largest buildings in America will be to house the crowds that come to hear the gospel, you know, it would have been just as easy. He, he ministers in Nigeria. What does he care? It would have been just as easy for him to fly over and say, shame on this country. I can't believe all of the perversion that you've allowed. But he didn't. He came with a word to encourage the people, and it was from the Lord. So I sat there. I received from the word and uh, felt good. And so when the service was over, I got ready to go home. And before I could get out of my seat, that guy came and tapped me again. And he said, Bishop Oyedepo would like you to join him in the green room where he's at. So my cousin Teddy and I went, went over, and there was about, I don't know, 38 pastors or so that were there. We, we were the only, it was all Nigerian, so we were the only white people. And uh, he, he walked out of the restroom, and he put his hands on his hips, and he went, bring me the two white angels. It sounds like a prison gang. So we came over, and when I came to him, I knelt down on one knee, and my cousin knelt down on his knee, both on either side of him. That's, that's something they do in Africa, and I wanted to, I didn't want to stand there like some jabroni American. 
Hi, 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 Bishop. How are you? Good to see you. No, this is this is a mighty. This is a man of God sent to my generation, and I'm going to treat him that way. So I got down on one knee. Teddy got down on the other knee. I got down where his right hand was. Teddy got down where his left hand was. I was at the right hand because I have read the Bible. Amen. I wanted the, the extra blessing. So he said to you, he said to me, and, and let me throw this part in as well. He said to me that um, somebody, I'm just going to throw this over here because it's gross. I don't know what it is and it's bothering me. Uh, he said to me, Someone had called me two days before that was a minister I respected. He didn't call me. He called someone I knew and relayed a message. It was just when our ministry was starting to do, like, better. I wasn't struggling. I wasn't treading water. Things were going good. And a guy sent a message and said, tell Jonathan that soon he's going to hit a wall and his, his finances are going to drop out and he's going to be in trouble. Well, because I respect that guy. That bothered me because I don't want to hit a wall and I don't want to be in trouble. I've been hitting a wall for years and I finally broke through it. Let me give everybody here a help in life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that the gift of prophecy is for comfort, edification, and exhortation. Well, I don't have to define comfort for you. Everybody knows what that means. Edification is derived from the same word like edifice or building. So Prophecy, the Spirit of God, when prophecy is coming from the Holy Ghost, it's to comfort you, it's to build you up, and it's for exhortation. Exhortation is like light of fire under, I don't know about, in western Pennsylvania we use the term light of fire under your rear end. I'm sure you say nicer things here. But uh, I guess I'll say it like this. Everybody say motivate. motivate. So for example, if you were going to give somebody a prophecy and it was from the Holy Spirit, you want to just say you're going to hit a wall. The, the, the Lord would say, now, if you keep doing things this way, you're going to hit a wall. So do this instead, and the victory, it, it would always end where you left comforted, edified, and then felt a motivation to do something different. So I'm telling you that because when you get around the full gospel movement, some people hide out in meetings, and they give people words out in the parking lot. You know, my Uncle Ted finished preaching, and a, and a lady came up to him and said, Brother Ted, the Lord gave me a word for you. He said, what's that? This is like three years ago. She said, he said, this summer you're going to drown. <laughs> well, that's, and my Uncle Ted, you'd have to know him. He went, no, that's not true. She went, it's not. He went, no, I can swim, and then walked away. <laughs> so when somebody, when somebody gives you news that discourages you, discomforts you, and sucks the motivation out of you. I had a pastor, full gospel pastor. This was years ago. He texted me, the Lord showed me that down the road, the devil's going to attack your daughter, Jonathan. I wrote, thank you for sharing, and then blocked his number. And then he told a minister, I know, he said, I've been having trouble getting a hold of Jonathan. You're going to have a lot of trouble getting a hold of me, because if you're dumb enough to text me something like that, you've lost access to my phone number. Can you say amen? amen. If you're in, in the ministry and you're too stupid to know that word didn't come from the Lord, then I don't want to talk to you anymore. Who, no, the Holy Ghost wouldn't tell me, hey, Jonathan, just so you know, your daughter is going to have a problem. The Lord would tell me, even if there was a trouble coming. Let me show you the gift of prophecy. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles 20. Anybody getting any help tonight? This is an impartation service. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Say it out loud with me. The Lord is good, the Lord is good. and his mercy endures forever. There's three armies getting ready to attack the children of God, and they might be able to take out one of them, but they can't take out all three at once. It's like if you're playing basketball, you might be able to beat five guys, but if 15 are gonna, if you're going to play 15 on five, that's going to be a tough game. So they cry out to God, and watch what happens. The Bible says, you told us that we can come to the temple, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 9, and whenever we're faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine. Say those three words with me. War, war plague, plague, famine. War speaks of general unrest, broken home, enemy coming after your marriage, a child that you raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord that now is going their own way. General attack. Plague. Plague is Old English for incurable disease. 
That's why when I listen to these dumb, dumb pastors during COVID and evangelists, they're, you know, not just pastors, they were evangelists. I, one guy went to book an evangelist for a meeting. He said, I'm not getting on a plane and risking my life till this thing's over. So it, it was a general fear thing. And they would say, well, you have to understand, Jonathan, this, this is a new sickness that there's no cure for. Well, the word plague in the Bible means incurable sickness and disease. So there's not some new thing. The Bible says anytime you're faced with war, general unrest, plague, everybody say sickness and disease. And famine. What's famine? Poverty, scarcity, and lack. Famine of finances. Famine when they plant their crops with not enough food provision coming in. Second Kings chapter 7. So basically, every attack of the devil has, will fall into one of those two categories. Sometimes it can be a combination of those categories. Mark chapter 5. There was a woman with an issue of blood who had spent everything she owned on doctors. That's called famine. And was no better. In fact, she was worse. That's called plague. She had an issue of blood that took her money. So the devil's attacks can basically always be categorized in those three groups. And the Bible says, they said, Lord, you said any time we're faced with any of those things, we can come to you and you will, we can cry out to you and you will hear us. Keep going with the verse. You will hear us. You will save us and you will rescue us. Say this out loud. I do not serve a prayer listening to God. I serve a prayer answering God. So the devil comes in those three veins. But then even in the old covenant. And we now have a better covenant based on better promises. They said we can call out to you. You know that's one of the things God bragged about. All these other people serve gods that are made of wood and stone that they carve their faces. God said they have ears that can't hear. They have eyes that can't see. And they have mouths that don't speak. But God said, I'm the living God. Nobody made my face. I made your face. And when you call on me, not I might answer you, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. I prophesy in the name of Jesus, any one of these three areas that's trying to run loose in your life, it comes to a stop tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, and there's nothing the devil can do about it. So rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has given you the victory. If you believe it, can you shout, I receive it? Well, ju ju just, just, as, just so you know, we're not blowing smoke and sweating and yelling for nothing. Let me, let me see. I haven't seen this yet. Let me see that kid's testimony. Okay, so my name is Garrison Decker, and uh, when I was a baby, I was born with open, well, I had to have open heart surgery when I was younger, and uh, I had a hole in my heart, and when I was 12, I had to get a stent put in, but things weren't quite right, and... I couldn't like run very much like I get very winded really fast so like it was kind of like hard like especially with sports and school and all that like you go to gym class it's like really tricky to like you know keep up with everybody else like we're running like we had to do our miles for uh, track and field and all that you, you couldn't go the whole way around the track I'd get very winded I'd be way behind people I had stopped by um, well jo Jonathan's um, speakings we we're at and God had healed me. I didn't have the courage to like go up to him myself, but I felt the Holy Spirit touch me and I felt a nice warm feeling in my heart. And he had talked to me and said that it's confirmed that I've been healed and that uh, I'm here to do good things. Yeah, I'm completely healed. My heart doesn't skip a beat no more and it's been fine ever since, so. Isn't that awesome? Give Jesus a big hand clap. That happened when, when he was young. And yeah, he's still young compared to somebody like me. But he's not, you know, that was years ago, and they came to lunch with us today, him and his mother, and they, his mother was crying. Tell him what happened to your heart. She said he hasn't had any problems. You imagine that as a mom. Your kid's born with a deformed heart. They do have to do a surgery on the little body. They did enough to not, so that he didn't die, but he's never going to be able to run and play like other boys. And uh, he's going to have a problem with his heart and probably won't live that long. And Jesus, I never prayed for him. He came to hear me, me walking around. That's why I like walking around. You heard Nadir say the same thing. He said, you walked by me, and I started feeling better. You'd almost think angels go work with preachers to help accomplish what God wants done. I'm going to tell you right now, if you've ever been to a bar or a club, 
you'll notice the feeling that you had at that bar and club and some of the negative things you take home with you, those aren't here. And then not only are they not here, there's a different presence here tonight. Because where the word is preached, there's power from God to set the captive free. Can you say amen? amen. Say it out loud. There's nothing the devil's done to me that God can't do something about it. Hallelujah. So they said every time we're faced with war, plague, or famine, you said we can call on you and you'll hear us. And you will save us and deliver us. Say one more time. God is a prayer answering God. God, answering God. I've noticed even in the full gospel movement. Full gospel we talk about because what I was getting ready to read out of Romans 15. I preached and God's spirit worked among you. In this way did I fully preach the gospel. So it's weird when you see full gospel on the front of churches because you don't go by any other churches and they say 21% gospel or 43% gospel. So it's like, what is this? Cream? There's half and half. There's uh, whole milk. There's 2% milk and there's skim milk. No, what they mean is some churches believe that the Holy Spirit's work died out. But then full gospel churches, at least on paper, don't believe the Holy Spirit's work died out. They believe that what we read in the book of Acts and in the life of Christ is to be carried on by ministers, and that's correct. Because Jesus didn't say, the same work that you see me do, don't try to do it because it won't work. I'm Jesus and you're nobodies. He actually said the opposite. The same work, it was a same work. The same work that you see me do, you shall do, and greater works than these. So Jesus said, after I leave, carry on as the Father sent me, so send I you. That's easy to understand. But I've noticed that people, even in the full gospel movement, have gone in the other direction. They say, they talk about life being seasons and storms, and Jesus is an anchor in the storm. And how many know sometimes we go through stormy times, and though we don't know why, but we just have to trust Him. One day in His timing, it'll lift. And they've basically started preaching like an Episcopal or an Anglican or any kind, of, any kind of mainline church that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. See, you notice those videos if you've been coming night after night. They, two people said, I said, what did you hear me say that made you snap out of being on 17 medications a day and having to go to the mental institution? The other person, what, what did you hear that made you get healed? One guy said, you said today is your day. And the other guy said, same thing. You said today, I don't have to put up with that anymore. Do you know this is the day the Lord has made? He doesn't have any will for you to suffer with what you're suffering with one more day. We serve a living God that answers by fire. You can call on him. He will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. Somebody say, I serve a living God. Now, if those people didn't pray, they'd have got slaughtered. Just like the children of God got slaughtered a bunch of other times in the Bible. Life is not a random course of events. Life works by cause and effect. You know, what idiot would quit going to work and say, you notice our finances have dried up? Yeah, you know what, looking back, it started to coincide about exactly the time with when I quit going to work. It's almost like that action produced a negative result. Christians almost have been trained to just think life's random. Sometimes the devil does things. You have to wait till it dies down. Then when God's ready, he'll bless you. Some people, he never blesses you. He waits till you go to heaven. But when you read the Bible, that's not what it says. The Bible says there was a woman. This is how faith works. Faith is not waiting for God to do something. Faith is taking what God said. That's what they did in 2 Chronicles 20. They said, God, you said that we don't have to. What you told us not to kill those people. And now they're coming after us. See how they've repaid us. But you said. Everybody say you said. You said I can come to your temple and when any time I'm faced with war like we're being faced well I can call on you. You will hear me and you will answer me. I am taking you at your word. I believe you're going to do what your word says you'll do. I take that now in Jesus mighty name. Somebody say this. I don't have to put up with the devil's mess. That's right. You can decide. Not gonna, in God's time. No. When you're ready. Whatsoever you bind on earth. I'll bind you in heaven. Or I'll bind it in heaven. Anything you permit on earth, I'll permit and allow from heaven. 
Why? Because the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof and all the inhabitants that dwell therein. Then the Bible says, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Earth is not in God's domain. Earth is in man's domain. It's not in the devil's domain. It's in man's domain. There's people here, obviously if you're preaching in central Pennsylvania or about anywhere now, there's people that in their past, or maybe even currently, have had a drug problem. Fentanyl, heroin, meth, whatever. Percocet. Nobody ever bought drugs from a demon. Are drugs demonic? Yes. Did anybody ever buy drugs from a, a, a demon? You texted 666 and hit send. <laughs> you rang. No. You had to buy drugs from somebody that's influenced directly or indirectly by demonic spirits uh, to get you that for money. And nobody gets saved by Jesus Christ directly or by angels. In fact, if you read in the book of Acts, when angels appeared to people, they had told them to go find somebody that was nearby that would go tell them the gospel. Can you say amen? amen. So I'm trying my hardest right now to preach out of you anything anybody's put in you that you wait for your healing. And in God's time, in God's time, when he's ready, the devil loves that preaching. Because when you accept that sometime in the future things are going to happen, then it gives him permission to keep knocking you around. But I came to tell that devil, his time ends today because God said, when you say enough's enough, his power will back you and knock the thing out that the devil's using to try to take you out. If you believe it, can you say a loud amen? amen. Somebody say, I decide. Say enough is enough. Mark chapter 5. There was a woman with an issue of blood. Jesus never came to heal her. She wasn't sitting there and Jesus healed her. She heard about Jesus. And she said. Everybody say she said. Think of all the things she could have said. She could have said, um, well, if he's really doing all that, how come he's never healed me? She didn't say that. She could have said. When's he, did he ever say if he's coming back this way again? She didn't say that. She wasn't angry and she wasn't passive. When she heard about Jesus, she said to herself, I know when I touch him. I, you know, whatever the Lord wants, amen. No, I know when I touch him. Not I hope I'm made well. She could have said that. I hope when I touch him, I might be made well. I know when I touch him. I will be made well. And she didn't wait for Jesus to come there. She traveled to where Jesus was at. Then there was a big crowd of people around. She didn't say, well, I tried to get to him, but he's always surrounded by people. She barged through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. Jesus didn't know who touched him. He didn't heal her. She grabbed his healing power. Jesus said, who touched me? The disciple said, Master. There's a whole crowd press around you. You're getting touched left and right. Jesus said, no, someone deliberately touched me. Think of that. So you can be in the presence of Jesus. If Jesus was standing here right now in bodily form, you could still leave this service with nothing. Because it's not just him being there. Somebody has to turn their faith loose for themselves and say, I'm going to get what God said belongs to me. I'm praying that that level of faith begins to rise in the people of Lancaster. Enough is enough. I'm going to touch Jesus tonight, and I know I'll be made well. If that sounds like you, let him hear your hand clap one more time. Clap your hands under the Lord. Give him a mighty shout of praise. Say it out loud. I will touch Jesus. Yeah. Brother Shambach that I mentioned, he used to say something in his meetings. That when I first heard him say it, it sounded weird to me. Because, you know, growing up in church, they'd say, uh, when the preacher first got the mic, turn and tell your neighbor that God's going to bless you today. Something nice. Don't, don't turn and tell your neighbor this is your day. Brother Schembach would say, before I preach, turn to your neighbor and tell him, you're not getting anything. I'm getting everything. <laughs> I, I think, that doesn't sound like the most Christ-like thing to yell at somebody sitting next to you in church. But I understood what he was saying. I actually can't get you to get something. I can, I can encourage you. I can say, you know, don't leave the service. Listen to what he's saying. He'll help you. But everybody has to have faith for themselves. Do you know a lot of times I've, I've, I've called people out by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when I call them out to pray for them, they'll say, no, I brought him to get prayer. 
Don't pray for me, pray for him. But you know what you find out after? That lady was, in the, was at work, you need to come tonight. God will touch you. Please come. God will pray. And God heard her talking and talking about how the Lord's going to work and move. And God was drawn to her faith. God is not moved by need. It doesn't say without needs it's impossible to please God. It says without without faith it is not difficult, impossible to please God. Then it tells you the two pillars faith works on. For anyone that wants to come to him successfully must believe that he is. Not that there is a God. That he is. Well, who is he? He's got like 31 names in the Bible. 33. I don't really believe God heals. Then you don't know God. Healing's not something he does. Healing's one of his names. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who healeth thee. And the Lord God never changes. Can you say amen? amen? I am Jehovah your victory. I am Jehovah your provider. I am El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. I'm your banner of victory. I'm the Lord, your righteousness. You have to know who the God you serve is. And I came to tell you, you don't serve any God. You serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the almighty God. And he knows your name and has got an answer for you tonight. Everybody say, believe that he is. I believe that he is who he said he is. And equally important, if I kick one of the legs out of your chair, you can't sit in it anymore. You'll fall on the ground. It needs all four, and faith needs both pillars in place or it doesn't work. So then even once people know who God is, they screw up on the second one. And must believe that he is a rewarder. Say out loud, my God God is a rewarder, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He moves by faith. Any Puerto Ricanos in here tonight? Who's the best evangelist to ever come out out of Puerto Rico? G.J. Avila, correct. G.J. Avila was preaching in the Bronx. Mighty man of God, friend of R.W. Shambuck. And my brother-in-law, my, my wife's brother, her dad was driving him around Christmas time, and they hit a pothole, and the back door jarred loose and ejected the sun. Bounced, door open, kid, kid flies out. Early 80s, no car seat. Flies out, hits his head, swelling on the brain, taken to Beth Israel or wherever, and uh, put him on full life support. My father-in-law was not a Christian, and he heard G.J. Avila was in Bronx, And he thought to himself, that's the best chance of my son not dying. So he goes to the meeting as an unsaved man. Everybody say faith. Faith. See, you can be a Christian that's going to heaven and have no faith. It's a shame to hear what happened. Something in my father-in-law said, no, I'm not having it end like this. And he went, in fact, it would have been just as easy. It would have been easier for him to go. I don't know, the last thing I want to see is that guy. If that God really heals me, I So when you let unbelief in to rail against God, that's why when a bad thing happens, if a bad thing happens, Satan works overtime to get you mad at God. Because if you get mad at God instead of believing in God, you have cut off your one avenue to come out of the pit. But thank God I'm not preaching to those people tonight. I'm preaching to people that have been through hell but have made up their mind, I'm going to heaven. Because from whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. My my father-in-law is still a big man at almost 80 years old. And back then he was 40. He barged through. Puerto Rican Bronx mechanic passed the ushers into where G.J. Avila was and said, G.J., I need you to come in the car with me and pray for my son. He's on life support. And G.J. said, I can't. There's 5,000 people here that I have to preach to that also need prayer. He took out his pocket handkerchief and some Goya olive oil, which any Puerto Rican has within seven feet of them at any time, or they're not a Puerto Rican. (laughs) Poured it over the cloth. And said, take this and rub it on your son, and he'll live. So my unsafe father-in-law drove to the hospital, went in the room, started to rub the cloth over Jose's three-year-old body on on full life support. Breathing machine, eating machine, trach, the whole thing. 
And my, mother, my mother-in-law didn't know what he was doing. You know, even Pentecostals don't know about that kind of stuff. Acts 19.11. Garments were taken from the skin of Paul and placed on those that were sick. And any sickness or disease they had was healed, and any evil spirit they had came out. If the residue of the anointing that was on Paul could drive demons out, why does anybody have to drag somebody into a back room for four hours? Can you say amen? amen. So he, he explained to my mother-in-law, no. He told, him, told her what he did, and then he left. Looked as dead as he did before he started. They were going to pull him off the machine, and uh, my, mother, my mother-in-law said, my sisters are coming down from Boston. Can you wait until the morning so they can see him before he dies? They said, yeah. So she came and received him. They drove from Massachusetts at about 6 in the morning. And uh, she went to take him to the hospital to go say goodbye to Jose. And when they walked into the room, she was, um, he was sitting up with all the tubes out eating cereal and said, hi, Mom. And he's living in Pittsburgh. If you call our ministry, there's a good chance you'll hear him on the phone 40 years later. That came. You know what did that? Everybody say faith. faith. Yeah, number one, he had to have faith, my father-in-law. Number two, G.J. had to have faith. I'm glad he didn't go see some preacher that said, sorry to hear about that. We don't, I guess God needed another flower for his garden. That's what you'd have heard in a lot of churches. But you know what? That's why God's wiping those churches. I know this sounds strong, but it should be said actually even stronger. There, you know those churches that are down to 20 and 30 people? After 80 years that don't that preach against the Holy Spirit, that have a rainbow flag out, they're not going to get more people. They're going to get wiped. Those denominations, you listen to me, those strong denominations that are 200 years old, they are going to get wiped off the face of the earth. And God is going to fill those buildings with new pastors, young evangelists, young pastors, old pastors with fire, old evangelists with fire that will preach the old rugged word of God and see their generation change. I'm looking at the people that are going to get God's power to their generation. Come on, take 30 seconds. Clap your hands. Let the Lord know you're one of them. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody yell, I have faith. I don't have unbelief. I have faith. God will make a way where there is no way. I said God's making a way where there is no way. Hallelujah. Man, think of what faith can do. Think of what faith can do. Just the fact that I believe God is the God of the impossible. And, and, and believe like that. I didn't know that kid had a heart problem. But walking by him. Faith. Just like you've been around people that are evil, and when they walk in the room, it changes the atmosphere in the room. Your stepdad went out drinking, and when he'd come back from the bar, you knew to shut your Nintendo off or your PlayStation and go upstairs because he was different. He had evil on him. Well, you don't think, just like somebody gets evil on him from drinking alcohol, that you can't drink of the new wine and walk into a room, and now the presence changes because God is going with you where you go. I'm leaving on Friday, but you're staying here. And you're going to stay here carrying the fire of God to your generation in Jesus' name. Come on, I don't hear anybody in here. If you're going to be a part of that last day move of God, oh, clap your hands, oh, ye people. Hey, have faith. Have faith in God. Believest thou that I can make you to see. Somebody say, I believe God. God. It will be just as he said. (laughs) Jesus did not teach faith as a coping mechanism or a life raft in the storms of life. I want to challenge all the pastors that are here. Take your Sundays. Instead of doing a six-week series on freaking relationships or time management, do a six-week series on what faith can do. Week one, heal all manner of sickness and disease. Your church will break out in revival before you hit the second point of the sermon. Start telling people about the power that's available to them in the Word of God. (laughs) 
Jesus did not teach faith as a coping mechanism. He taught it as a mountain moving force. If you have faith in God, you can look at the mountain, wonder when it's going to move, leave it in the hands of God. I'm not leaving anything in the hands of God, to be honest with you, because when you read the Bible, God lifts things in my hands. Thanks for three amens and a grunt. He didn't say leave it in my hand. He said, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind it in heaven. Yeah. I, you know what? At some point, when you've had enough, see, people are, 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 are lulled into complacency. It's a shame we had 11 more. How many overdose deaths were there this month? Anybody know roughly? How many overdose deaths are there about every month in Lancaster? I mean, I know you guys don't, you're Amish and don't like electricity. You don't read either. How many people, how many overdose deaths are there, roughly, every month? What would you say? 150 in Kensington, Philadelphia. That's one section of Philadelphia, 150 overdose deaths every month. And it would be less here, but it would be, it would be substantial. What would you say? How many? 60. That's, that's worse than 115 in Kensington, uh, 150 population-wise. 60. See, see no, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to say no pastors care. That would be harsh, but I'm thinking it. Because they don't. They don't know. And they think that the job is to go do a Sunday service, see how many people show up. What's the offering? What was attendance? Did we get parking out in time? Are the, are the neighboring businesses mad that we parked in their spots? No, all right, good. Let's go have lunch. But what would happen if a new David Wilkerson came out of this meeting and said, you foul devil. You think you're going to kill 60 of my generation every weekend? I got news for you. I'm going to take you out. And we don't do our fighting with guns. We do it with a more powerful force. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Now, I'm telling you right now, all you have to do to put a stop to that is find out where the drugs are sold. Just ask the, the DEA. They pretend not to know. Anybody knows. I know where drugs are sold in Pittsburgh. I'm not even in the DEA. I don't barely even leave my house or my church. When people are going into a barber shop and no one's getting their hair cut, <laughs> something's happening. Just pass the information along to the FBI. So find out where, 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 you know, ask. Ask a police officer. Where do you have to respond to the most drug overdoses? Where are they being sold at? Oh, there's a few places. Tell me them. And then plan a crusade right there. Right? Lord, send them in. No, the Great Commission is not Lord, send them in. It's go ye into all the world and preach. And then Jesus specifically said, man, I, I feel the presence of God as strong as I felt it this year. I see a turnaround coming to the state of Pennsylvania. I see the devil getting his sorry rear end blown straight out of the Keystone State. You're gonna go, you might go to Maryland, you might go to New Jersey, you might go to New York, you might go to Ohio, but you're not going here. Pennsylvania is a place that's for the presence of God, for the preaching of the gospel, for Christ's light to be seen. Every hand lifted. Every hand lifted. I bind that foul distribution of fentanyl. Since the CIA is helping, since the FBI isn't doing anything about it, since the DEA is not doing a thing about it, then we take it into our own hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, I curse the pipeline of drugs into Lancaster County. Let there be a destruction of everything that has its hand in that in Jesus' name. Let a great revival come to the youth of this county in Jesus' mighty name. In Je enough is enough. No more bearing children. In Jesus' name. I said in Jesus' name. Who does the devil think he is? He should be glad he's invisible. I'd go kick his... We'll just keep preaching. <laughs> wow, Jonathan, you're bold. Did you ever think maybe I'm not bold? You just lost your huevos somewhere along the line. 
Do you ever think maybe I'm just normal? You didn't know I was bilingual, did you? He's very bold. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm sorry. Maybe I'll do better. Maybe, maybe in another two years I can read about a bunch of 19-year-olds dying over the weekend and just go, oh, isn't that a shame? That's one reason you're to fast and pray. Fasting and prayer keeps the fire stirred up on the inside of you. You used to have people tell me when I was 21, 22, 23, some of you were in my youth camps. I preached them right down the road, right? Well, you're, well he's, he's a young on fire evangelist. I used to think back then, I'll be an old on fire evangelist. I'm not excited. Actually, if you knew me outside of the pulpit, how much energy do I expend when we're in your back room? It's like talking to one of the heads on Mount Rushmore. People come up to me after. I'd love to get, go out to eat with you and hear your thoughts. I just told you all my thoughts for two and a half hours. I have no thoughts left. <laughs> the fire is not a function of age. The fire is not a function of race. The fire is not a function of culture or caffeine. The fire comes from the Holy Ghost. The fire puts something in you where you say, enough is enough. I'm not putting up with the devil's crap. The Bible says, anytime I'm faced with war, plague, or famine, I can go to you, and you will hear me, and you will help me. And I came to tell Lancaster tonight, help is on the way. Now, this, this, this church is going to become too full. It's going to become too full on Sundays. And immediately it's going to become too full starting tomorrow night. This church is officially in revival. This county is officially in revival. It's going to spread out of this meeting into the churches that are around here. You're going to take it home with you to Scranton, to Allentown, to New Jersey. The devil's in for the worst nine months that he's ever had in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout revival. revival. I'm here this week to light a fire. Hey, tell, tell the truth, tell the truth, lady in the back. Was I was I was I stronger at, in my 20s or stronger now? Yeah, that's right. And I was plenty strong in my 20s. Everybody say the fire, fire. must never go out. You keep it stirred up. There's one guy, it's a wonder how I have any friends or any meetings. <laughs> this guy kept giving me a hard time for fasting. He was an older preacher. And uh, I didn't make a big deal about fasting. I didn't even tell him I was. We went out to lunch. I ordered orange juice just to throw him off the scent. <laughs> I was fasting. I was preaching a, a week of meetings. I was in my 20s. I was, I was going for it. Go, go with me. I, wa I want to have a great meeting. So second day we go out to eat. Hey, I, I noticed you've only ordered orange juice. Uh, are you fasting? I said, I am. Well, I used to do that. You know, I'm preaching at his church. He's in his 60s. 31 people, 34 people. Now, I know people say, now, you know, you know, whether it's a big church or a small church, let me tell you something. If I was 60 years old and pastored a church for 40 years and there was 31 people, I would go fling myself off a cliff. <laughs> it actually takes, <laughs> boy, that went over really well. Normally, <laughs> People like that kind of pastor. I, I would. I would wily coyote myself. How do you only, how? It actually, you have to be like spiritually deluded to have that few people. Because, you know, I have a wife. She's, her, both her parents are from Puerto Rico. She was born in the United States, but she's full-blooded Puerto Rican. Spanish is her first language. If I invite her and her sisters and their kids and their cousin. You know, our church grew from 260 to 1,000 people. Much of that is just her side of the family <laughs> moving down from Boston. I'm telling you the truth. Then the cousins started coming, and the cousin's boyfriend, and the cousin's girlfriend. And, and, and if, I just, if I just had their family over, we'd be just under 30 people. I think she had 310 at her quinceanera. I think she has 130-something first cousins. So how? I mean, I, Brother Jonathan, 
I'm having trouble growing my church. You should have married a Puerto Rican. <laughs> I've never heard a Puerto Rican say, we don't have any kids. We have a golden retriever that's like our child. You don't hear Puerto Ricans say that. <laughs> Puerto Ricans have babies. So I don't understand. I don't understand is basically what I'm saying. So he kept pressing me. You know, think of this with me. You would think, now if it was me, if I was in my 60s, and I invited this guy to come preach at my church. It's not just some guy he met at Cracker Barrel. I'm with him. And I notice he's not eating because he's fasting to, to have good services at my church. I wouldn't discourage him. I'd say, you know what? I appreciate you taking these meetings seriously. God bless you. Well, with, with his belly hanging over the table. Well, I used to fast like that when I was your age. But I noticed that uh, God doesn't love me anymore. When I, whatever he said, I started, my blood pressure was getting so high. Because number one, I hadn't eaten in two days anyway, so I already wasn't in a good mood. Then you start telling me you found a better way to do ministry. I mean, how can somebody be that deluded? Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know anybody's churches that are here. I'm not, I'm not doing this to criticize you. I'm doing it because there is, in England, in Canada, in the United States, in, in, we, in the West, in the European-ish places, there is a malaise that has come on pastors. Uh, you think it's normal to have four kids in a youth group, six kids in a youth group? It, it's, it's, a, it's a travesty. You think it's normal to have a handful of people and just let people die in the streets because they're not being reached with the gospel. So you have to address a problem before you solve the problem. You can't just pretend everything's all right. It's not all right to have tiny churches Sunday after Sunday. Yes, something might start small, but it can't stay small in God. So I tell you again, get ready for a wind of revival to double your church, double your youth group. Double your young adults group. Go get them. Stop waiting and move. Somebody say enough is enough. Well, I used to do that. But I found out God doesn't love me. I'm not doing it to get God to love me. I'm doing it because Jesus, you know, you may have heard of him. He, I personally, I consider him a central figure in Christianity. Jesus Christ, it's one of the characters in the Bible. He said, Mark chapter 9, this kind cometh not out. This kind of demon doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. I've cast two demons out in these meetings here. One Sunday night, one Monday night. How many of you were here? How long did it take? Yeah. 30 seconds. You know what that came from? Skipping meals when I was 20. I don't have to take long. I make eye contact and they're out. I was, I was at my church in Pittsburgh. Maybe I have some witnesses here. I ran my service way too long. I was going to, it was, I know when it was, it was October of 2022. And I had to go to Montreal. No, October, October 2023. I had to go to Montreal and Canadian Customs closes at 3 p.m. So I had to leave at 1.30 or I would not be allowed into Canada and I'd miss my meetings. So I, I was supposed to be done at 12.30. I got carried away. It was 1.03. You know, I had my own plane. It's down the road I can get on, but I needed to go like now. So I gave an altar call. Three people came forward to receive Jesus Christ. I was going to pray the quickest sinner's prayer in world history. And I said, pray this prayer after me. Father... In Jesus' name, and when I got to in Jesus' name, this lady threw herself on the ground and started screaming and jerking around like a snake. And I thought, you have to be kidding me. <laughs> so this is not how you cast out a devil. But I, I, I didn't think. All I was thinking was, I got to get out of here. I'm going to miss my meeting. I went up to her and grabbed her by the arm, and I looked her in the eyes, and I said to the spirit, I said, hey, I have a plane to catch. I don't have time for this. Get out now. And it went, and she got up. I said, you good? I wiped the stuff off her mouth. You good? Everybody think, okay, good. All right, let's pray this prayer. Prayed the prayer. Put into the altar workers, ran off the door, out to Canada. The devil doesn't set your schedule, and the devil doesn't block you. You make the terms. You do what God told you to do. That's what you're leaving here with. Come on, take 30 seconds. Make a joyful noise. Clap your hands. Shout. 
Move your feet. Wave your arms. Let everything that has breath. Praise ye the Lord. Somebody shout amen like thunder. Say it with me. The fire must never go out. I'm going to tell you one more thing, and then I'm just going to pray for you, because this, thing, this thing's like the roof's ready to come off. Everybody say, the fire. the fire. I got invited to go to a thing at President Trump's uh, retreat. I haven't told this before, but I'm going to tell it. So there's all these rabbis from New York. It's like an interfaith thing. And for God knows what reason, they invited me. I couldn't have done more things in my life to try to get not invited to stuff like that. So Adonis came with me. So we're in, we're in New Jersey at, at his club, and all the ministers are there. Then they said, let's pray for America. So they're going around the table and having people pray. And, you know, everybody's doing their, like, nice scripted prayer and their line that they worked on that other people would hear, you know, like preaching in a prayer. And I was just going to skip. I wasn't even going to, like, be one of the people to pray. Then the leader gets this pastor, Brother Tony, and says, this guy has, I think it was stomach cancer. And, and how many, why, let, we, let's pray that God heals him. So then they look at me. They go, Jonathan, would you mind praying for him? Well, I don't have multiple gears. I don't have dinner, pastor meeting gear. And women's breakfast gear. I got one gear. And when they said, will you pray for his cancer? I'm not looking to be an idiot at all. I mean, I, was, I wasn't going to talk. But okay, the guy's dying of cancer and went to prayer. Honest to God, I even thought, I'm going to like tone it down a little. You know, there's rabbis here. There's, there's Baptists. I'm not looking to like cause a problem. And we're, at, we're at a club. And there's other people at the club in other rooms that are like high-end people. But... Holy Ghost doesn't really care. He's not impressed by places. He was here before the world was formed. I said, I started praying before I prayed for the man. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I curse this work of the devil against this man's life. I curse this work of the devil against America. In the name of Jesus, I loose your power into this room. Thank you that you're a cancer destroyer. Thank you that you're a tumor melter. Thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. And just started praying like that. And I'm telling you, I felt the anointing about as strong as I ever felt it. Then I, 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 I told the man, come over here. I put my hand on his belly and held him up with my arm because obviously there's no catchers or a thing like that. I said, in the name of Jesus, devil, you take your hand off of this preacher. In Jesus' name, I command you to live and not die. And when I finished, the anointing was so, I'm not saying this to build myself up. I'm just telling you, what opens up for you when you actually honor the Holy Ghost instead of thinking you're going to open doors for yourself by keeping quiet about the Holy Spirit? Say it out loud. The fire, the fire. must never go out. When I finished praying for them, that's what they said, would you keep praying? Pray for America. Pray for what's going on in the country. I just started, I, I was already out from around the table. I just started pacing, pacing the room. And then uh, Pastor Paula White was there. She started praying in tongues, going back and forth. You ever seen her pray in those five-inch heels? She started praying like that. I was praying. And then other people started praying. When we got all done, it was the rabbi's turn. He's a nice guy. I talked to him the whole time. They, they said, you know, but they wanted to include everyone. They said, Rabbi so-and-so, would you pray? <laughs> He's a funny guy. He went, Heavenly Father. No, that's what they say. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why do I have to pray after him? That's what he said out loud. <laughs> Couldn't I have prayed before him? That, there was not, but actually, he quoted Psalm 126, I remember. It was great. And the fire of God fell in that place. I heard, I heard that guy's cancer is all out of his body now. Can you say amen? That's what I heard. I think I heard that. Somebody say, the fire must never go out. There's a fire that God has for you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We have three mornings left, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm going to teach on the gifts of the Spirit Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. 
Vocal gifts, revelatory gifts, and power gifts. Uh, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, vocal gifts. Discerning of spirits, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, revelatory gifts. Deser uh, special faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, power gifts. Because the Bible says, I wouldn't, brethren, I would not have you ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. That means God doesn't put a premium on stupidity. Well, the Lord wants to use me. He can use me. That's not how it works. You never get anything. You notice anybody that's ever used in healing or anything, if you talk to them, a hunger comes on them to study it. They'll start grabbing. I hate to read. And I found myself at 19 buying Oral Roberts books and A.A. Allen's book, The Price of God's Miracle Working Power. I would put it in my textbook at school, at, at Bible school, and be reading T.L. Osborne, Healing the Sick, while, while we were reading, you know, child psychology or whatever we were reading because I, I, I wanted to, I was hungry for this. Blessed are they that are hungry and thirsty. What brought you to this meeting today? Hunger. Who comes to church on Tuesday night when the weather's nice? And this is a nice town. I know I've been making jokes about it. You guys have, I've never seen a, a country town that takes coffee so seriously. And food, you got a Michelin chef, star chef in this town. There's plenty to do here. It's a beautiful place and it's going to get more beautiful. The, the devil's about to get cleared out of this place. I said the devil's getting cleared out of this place this week. The drug trade is going to get hit this week. They're going to get busted. Something's going to get messed up. The supply chain's going to get broken. Hallelujah. Lancaster doesn't belong to hell. Lancaster belongs to Jesus Christ. He died for every person that's here that they might live, and we're going to get them the gospel in Jesus' name. I said we're going to get them the gospel. I won't, I won't miss Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. If you're in the ministry, I'd cancel plans. Because it'll, it'll be worth your time. I have a ministry. I will not waste your time. It's a big deal for a pastor to break his schedule to come to me. I'm not going to goof off. The services aren't Diet Pepsi and the night's Pepsi. We don't goof off in the morning and then have a real service at night. I double the services up because I'm here one week. I don't know if I'll ever be back. If the, I, no, yeah, I'm, I'm not, you didn't do anything. You've been very nice to me. But there's so many places to go. Every place needs this. I almost, I almost canceled uh, Brother Tony. We almost canceled the meeting in, in Georgia two weeks ago because Vancouver went from 75 on Sunday morning to 340 on Wednesday to 502 Friday night in Canada. How do you leave? So instead, we, 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 we planned it down the road like, like three months from now. We're going to do a crusade. We're in an auditorium. L.A. I almost canceled and extended it. I was going to fly back for service Sunday morning in Pittsburgh and fly straight back and cancel whatever I had that, that next week. But I said, we'll just organize it down the road. The world's so big. That's why when I go a place, I take it seriously. I know a lot of evangelists just have some friends and go speak for them every year. But there, it, it's, it's, you can't, I can't do that. I'm hitting Lancaster. And I've been doing this ever since COVID because you never knew if you were going to be able to have churches like this again. Even though I did anyway. But I thought if this thing ever lifts and opens up again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smack it. 10 a.m., 7 p.m. If they want to wear our staff out, I'd add a 2 p.m. I'm, I'm praying, and not only praying, I, I prophesied it a few months ago. So I'm just giving you a heads up of what's going to happen. The day is going to come shortly in America where we do a 7 o'clock service like this, close it at 10, clear the auditorium, and start a new one at 10.30 or 11, and run it till 1 in the morning, and we'll have two night services. And then when the revival hits full scale, We'll have a third one. There was a guy named George Jeffries. Him and his brother, check this and then I'll pray for you. Him and his brother were in the Welsh Revival. The Welsh Revival was so powerful, it shut down rugby and soccer for a year and a half. It'd be like if they canceled the NFL in America for, for a year and a half because nobody would go to the games. That's why if you listen to English soccer, some of the teams still sing hymns in the games, like Christian hymns. It's from that revival. When they did open it back up, people would sing hymns at the games. That was in the 1800s. Which, by the way, the 1800s were worse than now. Just so you know. I don't know. That's amazing what happens in America. The, the gun crime rate in Dodge City, Kansas, Tombstone, Arizona, was 100 times higher than Chicago. Fort Worth, Texas, people just shot each other in the day, like over card games. 
Hey, I beat you in cards. No, you didn't. The place was a mess. And then this revival hits Wales. And one night in the revival, the whole church saw an open vision of a cross with a lamb on the cross with a crown of thorns. And there was blood dripping down the cross. And everyone looked at it with their hands lifted. Some were speaking in tongues. And two little boys, 9 and 11 years old, Stephen and George Jeffries, got up from their seats and sat under the vision. And they both became two of the mightiest preachers. Actually, George was the one that laid his hands on Reinhard Bonnke the day before he died. Reinhard Bonnke was a young guy. He was going through England, and he felt in his spirit to go see George Jeffries. Knocked on the door. George Jeffries said, oh, the Lord told me there was a young man coming to see me. Come in. Laid hands on him and prayed for him for about 20 minutes. And then he found out he passed away the next day. Then Ryan Hart, Hart Bunky went and, and carried that mantle on. Everybody say, the fire, the fire must never go out. Never so, when jo- Stephen Jeffries, his brother, had mighty miracles. You ever see an evangelist pray for somebody and one leg's like four inches shorter than the other? There was a guy whose leg was born deformed. It was 18 inches shorter than the other one. And Howard Carter, the head of the Assemblies of God, went to the meeting to check it out. They had to move the meeting to to Royal Albert Hall in England. 10,000 seater, 8,000 seater. It's still up today. It's an old, old building. People got healed. Blind people got healed. Born blind people got healed. He would do the service, 90 minutes, pray, preach, pray for the sick. Then he'd go in the back and have grapes and cheese and some juice, lay down. They'd clear the auditorium. Then there'd be a line of people over a mile long waiting to get in. They'd bring in the new group. He'd do it again an hour and a half, go in the back, clear it out, bring in the new group. And it went 24 hours a day like that. People didn't care if it was four in the morning, eight in the morning, 11. Now that happened before and that's gonna happen again. There's gonna be a hunger that hits America. I don't know what's gonna bring it, But a hunger is going to come back to the U.S. where people are going to stop caring about prom and school and soccer and finals. And they're going to call out to the Lord. And they're going to want to go somewhere where they can have an encounter with the power of God. As pharmacies fail them and the medical system fails them and everything fails them, they're going to be forced to find the one thing that never fails. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So tonight... Tonight, everybody say tonight. Tonight is about preparing yourself for what's coming. Where we started tonight is where we're going to finish. I didn't realize when I was going to see Bishop Oyedepo that God was preparing me ahead of time. Supernatural church growth conference. I wasn't a pastor. And I had, not only did I have no intention of becoming a pastor, I had strong intentions of never becoming a pastor. But God knew. And he sent me there in Bishop Eli Depo's first words. The day, the day is coming to this country where it will be full of super mega churches, but if you don't have faith for it, you're going to miss it. In other words, if you think it's a big deal to build a 400-seat church, then you're, you're going to miss 20,000 people coming. You're going to have to get your faith up for what's coming. When the woman ran out of vessels, the oil stopped flowing. So we got to get ahead of it. There's a wave coming. I'm telling you, there's a wave coming. Praise God. I said praise the Lord. There's a supernatural wave blowing across America right now. New York City will be shaken by the power of God. God's not looking to judge America. God's looking to shake America one more time by His mighty power. And He wants to use you to be a part of it. We went up to Bishop Boyadepo's office. He laid one hand on me and one hand on my cousin. And after that guy said that my ministry was going to experience a crash. That was 24 hours ago. David Oyedepo laid his hand on me and said, you've done very well. But the Lord wanted me to tell you, you're about to do even better. That this is just the beginning. And he said, you're going to be a part of this last move of God. And then he said very sternly, now take the things I preached you today and run with it. They don't just happen. You don't wait for prophecy to be fulfilled. You work to fulfill the prophecy. And he said one day I was going to be a part of it. So I just, 
been playing Call of Duty waiting for it to happen. That's not how it works. And so I'm telling you where you're going. And I pass that same word that he gave me on to you. However well you've done up until now, you're not going to take a backward step. You're about to hit a wave, and when you hit the crest of the wave, you're going to go even higher. Because this is the hour of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people that are going to scare the pants off the devil are not out there somewhere. They're in this room, and they're watching online. So rejoice and be glad for the Lord has given you the victory. The devil will rue the day. He didn't kill you when he had the chance. See, you think your drug problem is going to keep God from using you, but what it's going to do is when you go see somebody in a tent city or on the street, and they go, you don't know what I've gone through. So you know what you've gone through. I was, I was you, but Jesus brought me out, and Jesus will bring you out today. I see an army rising up. Let me pray for these two ladies. These two ladies come right around the back. Both of you, in Jesus' name. Hand of the Lord's on both of you. Right there is fine. Just stand shoulder to shoulder. Lift both hands, close both eyes. Hand of the Lord's on you. The enemy, lift your hands all the way up. The enemy tried to kill you before you were born, shortly after you were born and several times since. But I, the Lord, have preserved you for this time. And I will use you in this last hour. Like that kid that I, that I ministered to that had the heart problem, when the enemy tried to take your life before you were born, something didn't quite form right. And I feel like your whole childhood, you battled different sicknesses and stuff. But the Lord's gonna strengthen your body right now. You're gonna be the healthiest you've ever been in Jesus' name. Jesus. I see a fresh wind. Every hand lifted it. Let the anointing come in this place even stronger right now. Sing this if you know. The Lord, oh, I see a fresh Just begin to pray in the spirit with your hands lifted. As you do, the anointing comes on even stronger. If you've not been filled with the spirit, God will baptize you right now. Begin to cry out to God from your spirit. Rondo re bastandie, rondo re mandie, i karega, i bostondi aramondi eraba, rindia, 
Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this last move of God. Come on, pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in English. Pray in Spanish. But everybody's mouth should be moving. Pondo recata. Iskandiana mundi. Bidandiana bobraga. Dindiana mo reka. Dios te bendiga en el nombre de Jesús. Milagros de Dios. El fuego de Dios. En el nombre de Jesús. Rindi araba. Rindi araba. Rindi araba. Explode this meeting this week, Father. Explode this meeting this week, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Rindiana Mondie, Rishoni Araba, Rindiana Mondie, Panda Recato Steca, Indiana Mondie Rabo, Rondo Rapasta, India Rabo, Ricata, Eska, fresh fire, fresh anointing, fresh power, fresh fire, fresh anointing, fresh fire, Rindo Rocoto Stede, fresh anointing. Fresh fire, fresh power, fresh fire, fresh anointing, fresh power, fresh fire, fresh anointing, fresh power. You, who's she? Say it again. Your cousin. Bring her up here. You, you can keep playing, Brother Tony. Nice to meet you. Lift both hands, close both eyes. Hand of the Lord's upon you. This is an endowment of power for ministry. When you speak, God's power is going to move. Even if they have you speak at like some ladies' breakfast or something, if they have you open in prayer at a ladies' breakfast, it'll mess the breakfast up. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Fresh fire. 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 I pray every person leaves here tonight shaking up for eternity. You'll never go back to normal after tonight. You will never go back after no to normal after tonight. Fresh fire. Sing it one more time, Sister Clarita. It's fresh fire. I see fresh fire. Oh, I see fresh fire. Burning across this land. Yes, nothing or no one will be able to stop it. Nothing or no one. This year's going to finish. We'll be able a to full stop it. Hey, for it is a mighty fresh fire from the Lord. Hey, come on. hey I see revival. See? I see revival. Bethlehem, Lancaster, Rising Harrisburg, Mechanicsburg, York, Pittsburgh, hey, Philadelphia, America shall be shaken by the power we'll of be God. be able to stop it, for it is a mighty revival. It's a mighty revival. It's a mighty revival. Close both eyes as you do the fire of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you don't like this kind of noise, I can, I can recommend a hundred churches in the area. That's it. Take it. It's yours. Tindiabra Correga, Indiana Mo. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. This, this fell in the Lifestyle Christianity t shirt. Come right out. 
Lift both hands, close both eyes. Now, this God's going to add something to your arsenal. This is an anointing to handle the Word of God. To teach and preach. The anointing to teach the Bible and preach the Bible along with praying for people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for, the, let me pray for this lady uh, here. Come right now. I've seen you in another church before, huh? Lighthouse. Nice to see you. Lift both hands, close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes upon you. And a quickening, strengthening touch for your body. Is Brother Vern still here? I was going to pray for him, but I think he's here all week, so if he had to leave, I'll get him another time. Praise God. Hallelujah. My friend from Revival today, come around. I'll meet you up here. Praise God. Both hands closed, both eyes. You know, the thing that brought you to revival today, a hunger for the Holy Spirit, an unwillingness to sell out the Holy Spirit, there's a reward for that. And that reward is coming upon you and your wife and your family, even to a greater dimension now. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after my righteousness, Robbie Phil. He goes to my church in Pittsburgh. I preach till 1, one o'clock. 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and then you drive another four hours to be back Tuesday. That's, that's hunger for God. Most people would send a three-hour sermon and not come back for two more Sundays. Jesus, Let me pray for this young lady. Here, uh, button-up shirt, black undershirt. Yes, come right around. How many of you feel a fresh wind? Lift both hands, close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes on you even stronger. I see open doors. I see God opening a door for your ministry that nobody can shut. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name, O Lord. I pray for this fellow in the gray polo right now. I've seen you at a church before, huh? Where? I pray for you too. Shoulder to shoulder, lift both hands, close both eyes. That's it. You look healthy, but I'm telling you, the Lord is doing a miracle on the inside of you right now. Total miracle in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Fire. Now, I don't say this stuff much, but I'm going to start saying it more. I used to hold back on, believe it or not, on things I said because I didn't want people to think I'm nuts. But then if you read the news, if you believe the Bible was written by God and that Jesus is the way to heaven, they treat you the same, so you might as well tell the story. One of the times I went to go see Rodney Howard Brown, I pray for this lady in the black shirt, red band. Come right out to the middle. Here, go around to the, to the middle aisle. Praise God. Are you hearing any better today from last night? Say it again. Okay. You can tell the Lord open your ears up. Good. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. God's hands on you for the ministry. The Lord's going to use you. So if that's news to you and it doesn't ring true with your spirit, you can forget everything I said. But if you felt the Lord putting his hand on you back there to use you in this last move, then it's confirmation for you to go with it. Now, I'm not just saying, I'm not necessarily even saying this to you, but for everybody. It, once you know that God has put his hand on you for ministry, 
It narrows the field on who you can date. It's very hard to have a ministry if, if your wife uh, loves to drink and fight. It hurts your ministry. So you have to find somebody that's in the same, that's what the Bible means about not being unequally yoked. You find somebody, like when I married Adela, she was in Bible school without me, training to be an evangelist, without me ever being on the scene. She's going to do that whether I came on the scene or not. So then we just yoked up. I didn't try to get the bartender at Chili's to come with me on the road. Amen. Lift both your hands even higher. Close both eyes as you do the power of God that was on there on you back there comes on you even stronger. That's it. Now you know they say on Christian radio that we push the people down, and you can clearly see that we do. I pray for this young lady in the in the uh, green top. In in the in the yep. You're not in trouble. You're in the opposite of trouble. Then people say that they pay people to do that. Where would you get the people? I'll pretend to fall under the power for cash.com. Then there's like a drop down menu and you pick how many people you're going to have. Nice to meet you. How do you know them? How do, how do you, that's your daughter. So I knew her when she was a baby then. This is awesome. How old are you now? Twelve. How old were you at the first meeting? 21. Praise God. Those crusades that we play, her and her mom got saved at, at the, cru- the outdoor crusade we did in Allentown, and then she never stopped. I see her at every meeting ever since she got saved there in the 40 degree weather. You come, you're, God's hand's been on you since the womb, since you were in your mom's womb. Lift both hands, close both eyes. This is the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. You'll never be the same from tonight. God will keep his hand on you. God will speak to you in the night hours. You'll have peaceful sleep your whole life. In Jesus' name. Nice to meet you. I know your mom and grandma. Nice to know you. God bless you. Um, I want to read something to you. Stay on your feet. I found this interesting because people won't even know revival when it hits because you don't want to know how they won't know you have people even now saying do you think God's finished with America meanwhile on the news they're reporting all the baptisms that are going on at the University of Alabama how many of you seen that they're baptizing students in the fountains every night there's there's one celebrity after another Talking about reading the Bible and wanting to go to church. I keep getting, I keep getting tagged on Twitter. And when I look, some, some, some guy with 600,000 followers just said, I gave my life to the Lord. I'm going to be a Christian. Does anyone know of a good church? And so, so, some people will tag me. You should try his church out. Russell Brand. Joe Rogan said on his po- number one podcast, I just started reading the Bible. That America needs Jesus. You know, whether you like him or not, you got Donald Trump doing an ad that we need to get Christianity back in America, not religion, Christianity and the Bible back. So, so, you know, when you think of revival in America, you would definitely think of Billy Graham's crusades, and you'd be right. And his best crusade in America was his New York crusade in Madison Square Garden. Somebody sent me the article. Billy Graham's New York crusade got off to a rousing start last night. He said it could be the beginning of a spiritual fire that will sweep the nation and ignite the world. A crowd of 18,505 filled Madison Square Garden. That's a lot of people. But it's not, what did, didn't Lou Engel, Lou Engel just did an event in Atlanta, right? Didn't they have like 60,000? So, you know, it, it's, well, how, many, how many of you remember when Billy Graham was, through? yes, let's look at, let's look at what it was. Instead of glorifying it to some Greek mythology thing. 18,505 filled Madison Square Garden as Graham drummed at the moral sickness he said was loose in America and pleaded for a change of heart. We've lost God, he declared. His voice stern, his arms out thrust. We've lost our anchor, our moorings, our moral direction and spiritual sensibilities. At the end of the sermon, 
when he appealed for those who would give their life to Christ to come forward, 485 people came. Now, 480, which, uh, he said it was the largest first night response he's ever seen from the pulpit in America. Now, I'm not knocking his meetings or trying to elevate anything I'm doing anywhere near to the level he did it. He was there for six more weeks and then finished in Yankee Stadium. But I played you that Easter crusade that we did in Pittsburgh. What was it at the altar, 401 or 407? It was only 80 less. Then my dad simultaneously had 300 in Texas. So you, you glorify these meetings like they 18,000, 400 at the altar. We had more people come to the altar. How many of you were at when I preached the district youth convention at, at the Giant Center? Anybody from there? You know, so many people came to the altar that the head of the Giant Center said, if you do that again next night, I'm going to close the meeting down because it's a fire hazard. <coughs> Let me get one good one. All right, I'm done. Can anyone suddenly not smell or taste anything? No, I'm just kidding. So, um, and ever since I had that bat soup from the Chinese restaurant. So we had, I think we had 1,600 people come to the altar there. It backed up, it backed up the aisles and stuff. So. I'm not knocking Billy Graham. He's my hero. I'm saying people, I, I'm telling you right now, you could have 18,000 people come to a place and 400 come at the altar, and you'd have people go, I believe a revival will come one day to it. It's like, what do you think it is? So, you know, look now. I wouldn't take this for granted. I know this isn't a Reinhardt Bonnke crusade, but you also can't fit 1.8 million people in this building. So to have the church packed out to the bathrooms and on Sunday night packed all the way to the lobby, people driving in from New York City, what do you want? Yeah. Parking problems, lady that owns the building up, you know, people upset about where people are parking. Who was at the Dillsburg Revival those three weeks? Starting to get calls, people parking their trucks up on people's lawns. That's revival. Amen. America is in a revival right now. And it's going to grow and grow and grow the remainder of this year. What if this revival hit so hard that you forgot it was election night? Because we had just already taken over. Can you say amen? I pray for Brother Vern. Love you, brother. Honored to have you. Just stand right there. It's fine. Lift both hands all the way up. Fresh fire. Fresh oil. Everything that was prophesied over you at Ramah, the Lord puts gasoline on those prophecies. In Jesus' name. You're going to have a great year, my friend. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, let me pray for these three ladies. One, two, three. Lift both hands, close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes upon you even stronger. That's it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight and you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you need to do that 10 minutes ago. This is no hour to be living outside of relationship with God. You need to be born again. You can't live in sin. Jesus is coming any second now. You know, when, the, when they say they have to sacrifice red heifers, spotless, blemishless red heifers to rebuild the third temple, and there hasn't been one born in 2,000 years, and they've got four right now that are ready to be sacrificed before Passover, I'd get right with God. I would not sleep with my girlfriend tonight or any nights till the wedding. I'd get my life right with God. 
where I lay my head to the pillow every night and know I have peace with God. I would not roll the dice any night with my eternity. If you're here and you've never given, think of it. Can you identify a specific time in your life where you made a public stand to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? And then secondly, if you have done that, are you living a pure and holy life right now? If you answer no to either of those, no, Jonathan, I never have. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm not asking if you own a Bible. I'm not asking if you believe in God. Have you ever made a public commitment to make Jesus, like Billy Graham did, called people to? Come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. I will be your God and you'll be my people. If you've never done that, do it with me tonight. Secondly, if you once did that, and as time went on, as the bridegroom delayed his coming, they all became drowsy and slept. There's a spiritual slumber that has come on people as Christ waited for more people to get saved. You say, Jonathan, no, I haven't stayed holy and pure. I've allowed things to come into my life that the Bible calls sin. But tonight I give my life. I'm not going home on my way to hell. I want to make things right with God. I want to settle my account right now. If that's you and you need to do that, I want you to come out of your seat and join me up front right now. I'm going to pray with you. Come right now. I'm not going to hold you long, but we're going to pray. We're going to get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Come right now. Everybody needs to make that commitment. Come right now. In Jesus' name, come. Come. Today's your day. This is your day. Come right to the center. God bless you. Who else before we pray? I need to make things right with God today. There's another. Keep coming. God bless you. I want to get my sins forgiven. I want to be under the blood. Anybody else before we pray? So proud of you. Say this prayer from your heart after me. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me in your blood. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lift both your hands to the Lord. Let me bless you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. The arrows of the wicked won't come upon you. The shield of faith quenches every fiery dart of the devil. The battles you fought before tonight, you won't fight them anymore. In Jesus' name. Have another. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You'll never be the same. Welcome to the family of God. Make sure they get literature from the church and stuff so they can plug in here. How many, how many, uh, how many people in full-time pastoral or full-time evangelistic ministry, not you, have, not you post like prophetic poems on a blog, like you have like a church that has like a roof and stuff, not like one in your heart. How many full-time pastors do we have here and full-time evangelists? Put your hand up. Let me have all of those ministers come and li line up across the front in front of these. I want to pray for you first. Appreciate you coming here, Brother Landon. I was glad. When's that church going to be ready, roughly? This December. Tell your dad I said congratulations. That's awesome. Really awesome. Praise God. That's a lot of preachers. That's a lot of preachers to find. Normally you'd only see this many at like an IHOP after church on Sunday. Every hand lifted to the Lord. I don't consider myself above you other than physically because I'm standing on the platform. But I'm doing this to bless you that whatever good things God's put in my spirit, I'm going to lose them by the laying on of hands to give you a little boost to double by December 31st. Two times, two X.
And then when you do that, double again. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for creating a major problem for everybody standing here at this altar. Too few parking spaces, too few chairs, not enough room to put the kids, not enough room to put the people. Where did all these people come from? Who invited these families? Double. Thank you that you're the God of the double. Thank you for practically doubling. In Jesus. Thank you for taking the frustration out of ministry. That's it. You're going to double, my friend. Double finances. Double. In Jesus. Nay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord's going to bless you for holding your dad's hands up. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Whether you're at the altar in your seats, Sister Clarita is going to sing one more song. I want every, every hand lifted. Let's sing this together in Jesus' name. How many of you can feel God's holy presence here? We're going to sing a song that whether you're Mennonite or Assemblies of God or whatever you are, you probably know this song. It's called, We Are Standing on Holy Ground. And the anointing is going to get even stronger. I'm going to pray for everybody that wants prayer tonight. But let's sing this song through a couple times. Every hand lifted. Go ahead and take it, Sister Clarita. everything that's in you tonight.
May I pray for this lady? You had your hands across your chest like you're, like you, the water slide position. Black, uh, black top next to the guy that has the pork pie dress hat on. Yep. And the, lady, the young lady next to you. May I pray for both of you? Both of you are wearing black. I don't know your names. Let me pray for you two ladies, if you'd let me. Gracias. While they're coming up, let me pray for this lady in the colorful top, three, row three, by the exit door. Come right up. Right there is fine. Lift both your hands. Close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes upon you even stronger. In Jesus' name, go right through you. There it is. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Espanol, English, or both? Espanol. Uh, dos manos to el padre. You can translate for me. No, you you can translate, right? Tell tell her that uh, the Lord is going to strengthen her heart, like her actual heart, cor corazón, like the physical one. And then it's going to make all your blood levels go to normal. And your feet won't hurt. Because the blood's going to go to your feet. And then God's going to heal all the other things too. Jesus. Name. So tell her to put her hands up where her heart is. I won't do that. God's going to strengthen your heart right now. In Jesus. Tell her she's going to have the best year she's ever had. Now, if you would lift your hands, God's going to give you an extra blessing for helping me preach the gospel tonight and being my interpreter. Thank you, Lord, for being a blessing to my sister. Thank you for lifting every burden and destroying every yoke of bondage. These nine months, April through December, will be the best nine months you've ever had. The Lord's going to visit your house. Any debt that's been a, a, a yoke around you, the Lord's going to shatter that debt. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And then here's the second blessing. A bonus for being my interpreter. In Jesus' name. You did a great job. God bless you. Love you. Te amo. Te amo. Te adoro. Adios, bonita. Praise God.
Someone say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For his mercy endures forever. One more time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For his mercy endures forever. not his judgment endures forever, it's his mercy endures forever. If you like preachers saying God's going to judge America, you're not going to get along with me. Because even, even when God, when God's angry with a nation, even in the Old Testament, like Nineveh, he doesn't, he sends a preacher to preach the word and see it flipped in revival. Can you say amen? I think most preachers that preach that God's going to judge America, they just are, don't have like a good marriage or they're constipated. They're just angry. They're like taking it out on the people. Personally, that's how I feel. Be seated briefly. We're going to line everybody up to pray for them. But since we won't get the service back after, I'm going to give people an opportunity to sow seed. Philippians chapter 4. How many of you were blessed tonight? Philippians chapter 4, let me show you this out of the Bible before I give you the opportunity to give. Paul said in verse 10, Philippians 4.10, How I praise the Lord that you're concerned about me again. I know that you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need. Say that line with me. Say, not that I was ever in need. So Paul did not have a ministry that was a needy ministry. He said, I was never in need. Then he said in verse 15, as you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the gospel and then traveled on to Macedonia. No other church did this. All those meetings Paul had, they never gave him one dollar. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bless you. Looking forward to when you come back again. But then the Philippian church said, we're not just giving him a pat on the back. We're going to give him finances and erase the needs of his ministry. So Paul never wrote this to the Colossians or the Corinthians. He actually wrote the opposite to the Corinthians about how cheap they were. But then he said to the Philippians, the same God, verse 19, who takes care of me, will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So people take that verse and quote it like it's for everybody. Well, I'm two mortgage payments behind, but how many know the Bible says God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory? Not for you, necessarily. Because that was a blessing that Paul said, because you erased my, I was never in need because you kept sending help with Epaphroditus. They gave him money when he was there. Then they kept sending money to him wherever he was. Now think of that. You couldn't go to apostlepaul.org and sow a seed. They had to give this guy Epaphroditus a bunch of money and have him go travel dangerous Roman roads to go find him. And Paul said, because you cared about the needs of my ministry, the same God that supplies all my needs will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Erasing, making a point to erase needs guarantees that you'll never have needs. Now, when, they say, when Paul said that, no other church did this. I always think of this guy, Jack Mitchell, because my dad traveled as an evangelist, and still is, for 45 years, and he'd get $100, $200 for a week of meetings, and then one day, my dad came home from preaching just a Sunday morning, Sunday night in Massachusetts, and when he got home, he, was, he didn't look tired. He was smiling real big, and he went, Judy, my mom, get the kids, let's go out to eat. We didn't go out to eat. Unless it was a special occasion, Sunday afternoon. And so my mom said, okay. We went to this, we didn't go to like, we went to a nice restaurant, which we didn't do. And then my dad ordered steak. And my dad's smiling real big. Finally, my mom goes, Tiff, what's going on? My dad, with a big smile, pulls out, I'll tell you what an impression, I was nine, I still remember it clearly. He took out $5,500 in $100 bills. This is in 1989. So that would be what? I don't know, 20, 22 grand, something like that now. He took it out and plopped it down on the table 100 at a time. And my mom went, Tiff, put that away. And he just giggled and kept doing it. <laughs> now listen, I know people don't like this kind of talk in church. And how many know money doesn't make you happy? That's not true. 
Because money can be used to buy ice cream, and ice cream makes you happy. So it's not the money that makes you happy, but it's what you can do, what you can do with it that does make you happy. And I'll tell you another thing. People can say money doesn't make you happy, but poverty definitely doesn't make you happy. Can anybody say amen to that? So my mom said, wow, where'd you get all that money from? My dad preached Sunday morning and Sunday night at this church in Massachusetts. And when he did, um, first the pastor took him out to eat. Did you ever see that, that dressing, Ken Steakhouse dressing? There's an actual Ken Steakhouse in Framingham, Massachusetts. And they built it back in the 80s. This guy built a steakhouse that was so good, people would drive out of Boston to go eat there. It'd be like people driving from Philadelphia to here to go, to go eat. So he took my dad there to eat, which pastors didn't do. Pastors took you to Golden Corral, IHOP, Waffle House, trying to make sure you were dead by age 31. And so uh, my dad ordered chicken, you know, just to order something. You know, the church was paying for it. When, he, when my dad got done ordering, the guy said, are you done? He said, yeah. He said to the waiter, cancel his order. Bring him out the 22-ounce porterhouse and bring him a lobster tail and ordered my dad like my dad was a king. My dad was a young evangelist, hardly had any money. And my, my, da my dad was just blown away. They didn't put him up in a cheap hotel. They put him up in a nice hotel. Then he went to preach. And they had great meetings. Normally, you would get $100, $200. This guy gave my dad, I'm talking my dad would get $200 preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night, $100, $200. This guy gave him $5,500 for preaching a Sunday morning, Sunday night. My dad came home, and I saw, I honestly think, not that anyone cares, we're not giving by eulogy or my biography, but I think my giving got shaped that day because I saw what that the difference in my dad's face money is an encouragement you know I'm not bringing this up to rub his nose in it or the church's nose in it but he was talking when he told me that, that Pastor Joe's he when they, he told me they were going to move into this building and was telling me he wasn't telling me to whine he was telling me like praise the Lord we needed a new building the Lord provided a new building and we're moving into it and I came right out of my spirit I said, I'm going to pay for the first month lease of your church. And then when I said that, I felt the Holy Spirit go, keep going. And I said, I'm going to pay for all the months for the first year. And I said, that, that'll give you a chance to get ahead. So I, when, when did that expire? That's February. It was right when the church started. I said, that'll give you a year to get ahead and do the other stuff. You know, he was telling me, it's not just that you paid for it. See, when people do stuff like that, it's like, you know what? God is with me. You know, money, money, as much as people say money doesn't matter and stuff, it matters. Because when you leave a meeting with 40 bucks and don't have enough money to get home, you think, what did it, was I called into the ministry? Maybe everybody was right that I'm just, I should go get a job and stuff. And then when somebody does something like Jack Mitchell did for my father, who Jack Mitchell's in heaven now, you feel like, I can make it. You know, for all the knuckleheads God sends into your life, it only takes one Epaphroditus or one group of Philippians. Notice how Paul remembered who helped him. You never forget who went out of their way to hurt you, and you never forget who goes out of their way to help you. And so Paul said, I didn't read all of it because I've read, read, I've talked enough tonight. But Paul said, I'm not bringing this up because I want a gift from you. See, he's not saying, like, now, remember how you helped me? I'm not dropping a hint so you help me again. At the moment, I have more than enough. I'm saying this because I want you to know you're going to receive a well-earned reward for your giving. What you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. That guy, Jack Mitchell, I never got to meet him on earth, but I, I'm going to go give him a hug in heaven because he, he helped my dad. And my dad, my dad, I remember that, took us out to eat and was just happy and started getting ahead, could pay off different bills. And then my dad, of course, he's doing great now, but that's what springboarded it. And so you have the opportunity in an offering. That's what I made up my mind I was going to be at nine. I'm not going to be somebody that needs a Jack Mitchell. I want to be Jack Mitchell. I want to be somebody that people go around telling people, hey, Jonathan really helped me out. In fact, just, just last week in Georgia, we went to eat at this seafood restaurant. It's called Rose Hill. It's an old seafood restaurant in Georgia. <laughs> Hardly anybody's eaten there under the age of 70. They have great fried seafood. And I just thought, 
You know, you look around, people have on Vietnam veteran hats. They're on disability from the war. I went up front, and I knew three tables full of people. And so I said to the guy, they were from the church. So I went up to the, the lady, and I said, I want to pay for that table, that table, and that table. Well, when I looked, those couples were all white, and everyone else in the restaurant was black. So I thought, well, I'm going to look like a giant racist. Let me pay for all the white people, and the black people can fend for themselves. So I said, you know what? Everybody that's eating right now in the whole restaurant, there's only like eight more tables anyway. I said, just put them all on my bill. They said, everybody? I said, sure. Everybody that started eating, that's been eating and starts eating right now, put them all on me. Do you know how fun that was to do? I told, <coughs> I told them, don't tell anybody. But just like when Jesus said, don't tell anybody who healed you, and they go tell everybody. I never got so many hugs from black people in my 43 years on this earth. <laughs> One after another. Hey, I know they told me not to te te tell you, but thanks for taking care of my meal. They had given me a hug. I, 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 I felt very good. It's nice to be a blessing. And then when you're a blessing, what you make happen for others, Paul said, God will make that happen for you. So the way they taught offerings when I was growing up in church is that we should live on less so that churches can get built, missionaries can do their work. But according to the Apostle Paul, that's not possible. Because you know how you went out of your way to a supply for me? Paul said, the same way God supplied for me, he's going to erase all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So the offering is an opportunity to do something in a big way. I paid for for this church's first year lease, lease payment, we were then given right after that 24.8 acres of land to build our church. It's worth $5 million right on the interstate. Don't pay a dime. Because what you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. And God, God, God causes it to come back, press down, shake it together, running over. That land's worth more than the lease on this church. So if I was a normal person, I would have said, well, I would love to have, help Pastor Joe. But I have a church in Texas that needs built and a church in Pittsburgh that needs built, so we need to keep it. But if you take what's yours and use it to bless others, then God takes care of the thing that you need. Amen. So whatever the Lord would speak to you to give, but make a big move. You can't put $10 in an offering and believe for an airplane or a, a building. Give in proportion to your dreams. If you're believing for something big, put a, put a seed in the ground that will cause it to come forth. Uh, if you'd like an offering envelope, they're in the back of your seat. If you don't want to give, but you want to look generous, you can just pretend, like play with it, write a fake thing. <laughs> Revivaltoday.com, and you click give now. So you don't notice taking the offering, I just want to tell you there's a reward coming. You don't have to talk people in central Pennsylvania into giving. People in central Pennsylvania are very giving people. But I want you to know there's a reward so you can have your faith out for it. Amen? So your envelope's there in your seat. RevivalToday.com, click Give Now. If you're watching online, RevivalToday.com, Give Now. Cash app, dollar sign RT Give. If you want to mail a check, watching online, Revival Today, P.O. Box 7, Prosperity, Pennsylvania, 15329. I'll give you a minute to do that. How many appreciate Life in Christ Church opening their doors up to have this great week of meetings? Pastor Joe Spence. Tomorrow, I'm going to do something I've never done before. There's a guy that gave me a Falcon 50 jet to use. And um, it's, over, it's over at the, uh, where's that airport? Littitz. One time I called it Littitz, and I got corrected by the church crowd very quickly. Littitz! Littitz! I thought it was a French word.
lit it. Not the other way. That's a true story. I said, I didn't know how to say it. So the plane's there, so check this out. I'm going to leave after the morning service, drive to that airport. It's like 14 minutes. I'll be at the airport in Pittsburgh in 38 minutes. And then I'll be at my house in 15 more minutes. So I'll finish preaching at 1230. I'll be at my house by 115. I'm having lunch with my wife. My daughter will come home at 3.30. We're going to have dinner together. And then I'll leave my house at 6 to come preach here at 7. So I told my daughter, I told my daughter that, um, because she she gets sad when I'm going to leave. I said, don't get sad. I said, I'm with you today, Sunday, right? So, like, think of this. I'm going out to preach for a week. But the only day she didn't see me is Monday, Tuesday. She'll see me tomorrow. She won't see me Thursday. And I'll be home Friday night at about 11.45. She'll see me. She'll still be awake. Isn't that great? So God is a God who takes care of his people. Amen? Somebody wrote on Instagram, God, God, uh, preachers, I don't think preachers should live an opulent lifestyle. I wrote back, if you think I care more about how you think I should live than spending the afternoon with my wife and daughter, you're smoking Hunter Biden's crack pipe. Amen. I'm not letting other people... uh, keep me where they think I should be. I'm going to enjoy the blessing of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I'm not criticizing Hunter Biden's crack pipe. You should get your own crack pipe. Leave his alone. (laughs) Christians aren't to steal. Amen. Praise God. If you're watching, Brother Hunter, we love you. We're believing for the best. Well, on that note, hold your seat up before the Lord. If you're watching at home, same thing. Father, thank you for a hundredfold return on every seed that's sown tonight. As they erase need, thank you for erasing all their needs according to your riches and glory. In Christ Jesus, thank you for a hundredfold return on every seed. In Jesus' name. Everybody set? Go ahead and pass the buckets, and then we'll, we'll pray in just a minute or so. I heard someone fumbled the bucket. Put them on the bench and replace them with another halfback. Fumble, aisle two. Loss of possession, first down. This has been a great week of meetings. I'm excited for the back half of the week. It's going to be awesome. Praise God. What would you say there? Oh, I'm in Los Angeles next week. No, don't say I. Los Angeles, I don't know if you watch the news. They need a little bit of help. Just a little bit. God's going to give it to him. Well, we've been praying for people outside because, A, the weather's nice. We couldn't have done this last week. Is it raining or not? Uh, and then there's no room to lay hands on people here. I'm no spatial relations expert or engineer, but you're not going to line people up in this room and pray for them. And you don't want to bunch people up. Somebody falls under the power into somebody else's knee. 
and they have a good time in the Lord, but the other person has a torn ACL and is out for the season, that's not good. So we're going to do this nice and orderly outside. Um, we did this. Did we ever do that in Dillsburg? In that meeting? Did we ever lay hands on people outside or we had enough room in the church? I don't know when I started doing that. I think I had a revival in 2013 in Massachusetts. That was the first time the place was so packed we had to move it outside in the parking lot. And I remember there's a lady, she's still alive, her name's Yaya. She's 99 years old. I call her, she's a Greek grandma, Yaya. She's 99, Greek Orthodox, had never been to church before. And she goes outside, right? And we're laying hands. And I was super gentle laying hands on her because she's like tiny and, you know, a senior and new to church. So in Jesus' name. And then kept going. And when I got three people away from her, the ushers had already moved, the power of God hit her and she fell out and smacked her head off the pavement. And I mean, I just thought like, well, that's the end of old John. Because they told you about Bible school to be careful doing that. You're going to gonna embarrass all of us. You're going to go to jail. Uh, that, that definitely killed her. So I just, I'm serious. I mean, fell no catcher straight back. And you heard her head hit the pavement. So that's not good when you're 30, let alone when you're 88. So I kept going. <laughs> Finished praying for everybody. And then... I went back in, in the church, and I went to get my Bible, and I just sat down for a little bit, and I'm not joking around. I just came to grips with the fact that, like, I'm going to go to jail or get sued or whatever. And then she comes walking in. So I worked up enough guts to go over to her, and I said, hey. I said, uh, I saw you fall out there. How are you feeling? She went, feeling, I feel better now than I did before I fell. And I said, praise the Lord. <sighs> Live to fight another day. So I said all that to say, if you fall on the pavement now, I don't care because uh, we're going to have people to catch you. But we're just moving outside so there's room. There's not room here. We don't want to splatter all the chairs everywhere. And there is room outside. So just do me one favor. Pennsylvania people are generally friendly people. Don't start talking to people on your way out because it's a little bit of a challenge to move the anointing outside. But if, if you'll not start slapping everybody on the back and, and talking and just stay shut in with the Lord on your way out there and uh, stand shoulder to shoulder, then after that you can talk all you want. And um, But I want you to get ready to receive. We told you tonight's a night of impartation. One of the means of impartation is the laying on of hands. Timothy, stir up the gift that came on the inside of you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of love, power, and sound mind. Stir up the gift that came on the inside of you when I laid my hands on you. So I'm going to impart the good things God's put into me, into you by the laying on of hands. And you'll just feel a different grace working that, that's from the word of God. Amen? So I'm going to have everybody stand to their feet. I'm going to have Pastor Joe give you some instruction. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 in the morning, and I'll see you in a few seconds outside. All right, so we have two doors, this door right here, and there's another door in the lobby out there on the right side. So if half of you can go out that door, the other half out 